All right, good evening everyone and thank you all very much for attending tonight's Research Tuesday's presentation which is called Crater to Plate. My name's Kalia Primer and I'm a PhD candidate here at the University of Adelaide and I'm also your MC for tonight. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Ghana people who are the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the University of Adelaide's campuses at North Terrace, Waite and Roseworthy are built. Tonight's presentation touches on how the race for space is on again and it's more ambitious than ever. Multiple grand challenges are locked into space agency plans worldwide. A new space station orbiting the moon in the next five years, an established lunar base by the end of the decade and the delivery of humans to Mars by 2040. Unlike water, oxygen and fuel which can mainly be produced and recycled uh, in space, you might be surprised to hear that food is actually not readily available for harvest on the Moon or Mars, and resupply of resources from Earth is not a viable option. Uh, this is due to the current mass and volume restrictions for space travel. So during tonight's event, you're going to hear from two of our leading researchers, Professor Matt Gilliam and Associate Professor Jenny Mortimer, as they discuss some of the greatest obstacles uh, for mission planners in preparation for 2040 and including food production. They're going to discuss how space proves to be an ideal laboratory for developing innovative technologies uh, and provides new opportunities for achieving sustainability on Earth. Tonight's lecture is going to be structured a little bit differently to our traditional Research Tuesdays format. Uh, so following an introduction to their research, our speakers are going to sit down uh, with Associate Professor John Colton for a Q&A discussion, with John also sharing his insights across the topic. Uh, but don't worry, you are still going to have an opportunity to ask questions, and we'll be taking questions from our in-person and online audiences, so uh, I encourage all of our viewers online, please do submit your questions throughout the presentation uh, uh, by filling in the Q&A box down the bottom of your screen. Now let's get underway. I would firstly like to introduce you to our speakers, Professor Matt Gilliam and Associate Professor Jenny Mortimer. Professor Matt Gilliam is Director of the U University of Adelaide's Weight Research Institute. He is a current Web of Science highly cited author and one of only 196 plant and animal scientists globally to achieve this level of influence. And he's also a past Australian Research Council Future Fellow. Matt is also a former winner of the Australian Government's Science and Innovation Award for Young People in Agriculture. And uh, Jenny Mortimer is an Associate Professor of Plant, Sy plant Synthetic Biology in the University of Adelaide's Faculty of Sciences, Engineering and Technology. She's also the leader of the California-based uh, Joint Bioenergy Institute Plant Systems Biology Group and was recognised as a World Economic Forum Youth Scientist, or Young Scientist, sorry, in 2016 and 2017. So please join me in welcoming Matt and Jenny to the stage. Okay. Thank you, Kalia. So I will um, just uh, begin by also acknowledging the traditional custodians of where we meet today and also for those watching online, the traditional uh, custodians and uh, owners of, of that land as well. I'll give a brief introduction with Jenny. We'll do 10 minutes, as Carly has said, and then we'll, uh, we'll hand over for questions. And I'm very excited about speaking about this topic today and also discussing with you um, some of the, the pointy questions and maybe direct those to Jenny and John. What I'd like to start with is an overview of the, the plans of some of the international space agencies. And that's perhaps best illustrated by this particular illustration showing NASA's plans of first going to the moon under the Artemis program. And so Artemis, by no coincidence, was named after the twin sister of Apollo. So that is obviously the, the first uh, name of the, the moon missions. So Artemis will actually deliver the first female to the moon and person of color. But not only that, it's a forerunner to much more ambitious plans to go beyond the moon. So setting place down on, down on Mars. So it's unprecedented at the moment, the amount of activity around space. And that's partly due to private enterprises being involved in space. So about 20% of the investment in space came from private enterprise last year. 
And everyone will know, you know, you can't open a newspaper nowadays or, or look at notifications on if you're uh, more digitally minded on your, on your device, and space will be there every day. And that's partly because of the activity of these companies, such as SpaceX, Axiom, Blue Origin that you'll have heard about in the news, and many others, and they are democratizing space. They're allowing researchers such as myself, Jenny and John, and many others at the University of Adelaide and beyond to access space and test our research and do things that we couldn't have imagined of a few years ago. So in terms of the timeline of space and where we're going, so the Artemis missions, they're planned by the end of this decade, we will have a presence on the moon. And then prior to that, so you'll see that uh, new space LEO station, that is uh, the near Earth orbit. So there'll be a number of space stations run by private companies that are replacing the ISS when it goes out of commission in about 2030. Then, obviously, once we have our moon presence, and there'll also be a space station orbiting the moon called the Lunar Gateway that you may have also heard about. And as I said, this will be a forerunner to and testing the kinds of research that needs to be done to sustain a human presence on Mars in maybe about 20 years' time. That's the current line, timeline. So deep space exploration is certainly on the agenda and is certainly something that we're working towards. The issue with space, obviously, when we're talking about a human presence in space, is that we have to take everything with us to survive and thrive. That's not easy in low Earth orbit, but it is possible. So in terms of supply, in terms of the space station, it's only about 420 kilometers up. That's the distance uh, based from here in Adelaide, driving to the Flinders Ranges. There are about 10 deliveries to the, the space station a year. And so they can constantly resupply things like oxygen, things like food and medicines and, and whatever else is needed. When we move deeper into space, so Mars being at its closest point, 55 million kilometers away, so 120,000 times the distance from the space station away from, from Earth, we're talking about it being impractical to resupply. Not only that, is that it will take nine months to get there, and it will be a three-year three year round trip, and that's the current plans. Currently, it's been estimated about 10 tonnes of food will be needed for that four-member crew setting down on Mars, and we simply can't deliver that kind of payload at the moment. So there are plans afoot obviously to go bigger and better. We know about rocket technology. We know already that we can deliver the Perseverance rover to the surface. We've got the Ingenuity copter mapping the surface. Fantastic things. We can deliver rockets and rovers and, and things to Mars. What we cannot do is to keep people alive. And we had, just standing here yesterday, right in this spot, in fact, was the head of the JPL, so the NASA-run laboratory out of uh, Caltech that actually ran the, the Perseverance mission. And he said to me, I was standing, well, sitting just where Miles was there, and I asked the question about human habitation. He said, yeah, well, we can get there. Keeping people alive is the big thing, and food is one of the issues that we, we have to contend with. So talking about that in further detail, and to, to give a bit more background on that, would I'll ask Jenny to come up in a second. But these are the kinds of things that we have to work through. So we will need to supply on demand things if they go wrong. We'll need to supply nutrition. We'll need to supply uh, atmospheric conditioning. So I'd like to, uh, to invite Jenny up. We're both plant scientists, so we're going to be a bit biased here. But we're going to tell you about why plants are the answer as they are here on Earth. So Jenny, just hand over to you. Yes, so as Matt said, you might at this point be somewhat wondering why there are two plant scientists telling you all about missions to space. And 
the reason behind this is that NASA has, as, as Matt mentioned, have really recognized that we're good at the engineering and the physics, but the biology part, how we keep the humans alive, is the next big challenge. And they kind of codified that in five hazards that they identified that are specific to space that are really sort of damaging or dangerous to humans. So it's a, it's a closed and controlled environment. So that means you have to provide good quality air, um, there's only so much space you can actually, as in physical volume, that you have access to. We've got space radiation, so radiation is going to be a big problem for health. Um, the isolation, so the mental um, challenges around being isolated either on your own or with a very small group of people for a very long time, and also the challenges about not being able to go back home. The space station isn't that far away, so if you need to get back, even if you're not, there isn't actually a way to get back immediately, it's, Earth is not that far away. Mars is a very long way away, so nine months trip. It's a very challenging thing to think about. How do you, how do you keep your astronauts in sort of peak mental capacity? They've got lots and lots of tasks. They're very, very busy. They're basically high-performing athletes. So how do you make sure they're kept healthy? Distance from Earth, and that's connected to that. So we can predict what a mission might need, but there's two, two major issues here. One, unforeseen things happen all the time. There's only so much preparation you can do. So how do you deal with those unexpected circumstances? And the second thing is there's a limit to how much mass they can take. So to what extent can we actually produce things in situ as they're needed? And the final part is the low gravity or altered gravity. And we think that plants can be one of the solutions to all of these types of, um, of problems that have been identified. And I'll kind of talk through those a bit as we go. And it really comes down to the fact that on Earth, we rely on plants for all sorts of things. So I think, maybe I'm a bit biased, but we do take plants a little bit for granted. So if I ask you to think about the ways that plants impact your life, you could probably think about food. But they're also responsible for a lot of the clothes that we wear, so you think about cotton fibers, uh, building materials that we use, um, for uh, producing fuels, and particularly now we're thinking about moving into more sort of biofuels, renewable fuels, a lot of them are based on plants. Um, medication, a lot of the compounds that we use in, in medicine were originally identified from plants or are still even produced from plants today. Um, and then back to that mental health piece, the joy we have from having a green surroundings. So whether you're interested in gardening, so you, you keep a nice garden, or maybe you have a few pot plants in your office during COVID, Part of that isolation, people took up gardening um, as, as a way to kind of engage with a living being, even if you, you were in isolation yourself. So that kind of, they're core to a lot of our physical and mental well-being, and we can think about ways we can use those in space missions. And why do we want to use plants than, say, other um, systems for making items? So people use microbes, so yeast, for example, for producing lots of different compounds. People you have looked, talked about microbial fermentation for producing things. Plants have this fantastic ability of taking freely available um, resources that we'll find on Mars and on the Moon, so water, carbon dioxide, and sunlight, and they, through the process of photosynthesis, they convert them into sugars, which can then be used to, by the plant to make more complex materials. And so that means with very small mass uplift, so you can take some seeds, you can create large amounts of biomass with lots of different types of useful um, features. Now, that's all very well and good, but we need to really think about the types of plants we want to have in space. So we are designing, or we, we need plants adapted for a whole new environment. Plants didn't evolve to grow in space. Now, humans have been changing biological systems, including plants, for thousands and thousands of years. The crops that we currently eat don't resemble the, the wild progenitors at all. So these are just some examples you can see up here. Uh, the wild tomato on the top left-hand corner, very small clusters of berries versus the one that we, we grow now today. Um, and below that, you can see uh, the, old, the ancestral brassica that produced cabbages, cauliflowers, Brussels sprouts. So they look very, very different. And what happened over thousands and thousands of years was that farmers kept seeds, selected ones that had the properties they were interested in. And modern breeding has sped that process up. But really, if you think about the timelines of us going to space 
and the novel environment we're going to be in, we really need to improve that. And agricultural biotechnology, so techniques like gene editing, you might have heard of the CRISPR-Cas9 systems, have really provided um, ways where we think we can tackle these problems very, very rapidly. So people say, I would like this particular feature of a plant, and can we now deliver that? So that allows us to really let our imaginations run pretty wild, to be honest, and think about if you could redesign that crop to take with you, so maybe you were going to take five or six species, what would they look like? So would you even need a root system if you're growing them hydroponically and you're delivering all the nutrients to the plant itself? Maybe you'd want to plant that you can eat all of it so that you don't have any waste products, so that you minimize the amount of waste you're generating. Maybe you want something with a balanced nutrient content, so you get the protein, the amino acid, and the lipid content, and the, and the carbohydrate content that you need for a balanced diet from a small number of species. Um, can these plants be stress tolerant? Because the environment we're growing them is not going to be the environment they evolved in. So they're going to have to deal with perhaps high carb carbon dioxide levels, with um, all sorts of stresses. Uh, maybe salt stresses as well. So can we get plants that can deal and thrive in those environments? And finally, can we introduce some novel functions? Can, can we make them make some pharmaceuticals for us, make us make building materials? Or can they even report back on their environment to so act as sensors? They tell us what's happening. And perhaps we can even start to think about new crops. So one of my favorites at the moment, and other people maybe have heard me speak about, is duckweed. So if you've uh, walked along the Torrens recently, you'll have seen that it's completely green in places. And that was a photo sent to me by a, by a colleague recently. And this is duckweed, it's not algae. It's a plant that has returned to the water, so it's an aquatic plant. Um, and what you can see in the video on the right is it grows really, really fast. So you stick it on some water, you can go and fish them out today and stick it at home in an ice cream tub and some water and you'll see it divide. The reason we're interested in it is partly because it's very fast growing, it doesn't grow on much space, so you can grow it on very thin films of water, but it has a really, really great nutrient profile. So it's, it's high in protein, it contains all the amino acids the World Health Organization recommends, it's got uh, some fats, good fats, and some starch as well, and it's pretty digestible by humans. So we think it might be one example of a new type of crop we can start to think about um, for space. And so thinking about, so I kind of told you what we, we have at the moment, but thinking about the future, really it becomes about how can we engineer biology to deal with the, this unexpected. So this is sort of an outline of how I see things can be, is that you would identif and identify the need, and this is where plants are going to be acting almost like a green 3D printer, if you kind of have that in mind. We do the research on Earth understand what, what genetic engineering we would need to do. You would be able to transmit that DNA blueprint to the location, whether it's on the moon or on Mars. You would then create your, your organism in situ, um, and then you would be able to deliver that product pretty rapidly. Um, and that would allow you to scale and, and answer unexpected consequences pretty fast. And so with that, um, I will hand over to John. Thank you, Jenny and Matt. Before we get started, I'll, uh, I'd like to do a quick introduction of John. So I'd now like to introduce our Q&A facilitator and university academic uh, associate professor, John Colton, who is the director of the University of Adelaide's uh, Center for Sustainable Planetary and Space Resources and a former colonel in the US Air Force. So John will be joining our two speakers on stage to facilitate the panel discussion and also contribute to the discussion by sharing his own expertise. So again, please join me in welcoming John and our two speakers to the, uh, start the panel discussion. Thanks very much for the, uh, for the intro. Um, so they asked me to come up and, and ask a few questions, but uh, they gave me a mic, so I have a, actually a little bit of a preamble before I get to the, to the question here. So, um, I just want to say that uh, we're incredibly fortunate uh, here at the University of Adelaide to have uh, an amazingly talented team of scientists, engineers, psychologists, architects, uh, business and legal professionals that have joined um, the effort to support the return of humans to deep space, um, especially uh, into the future where we hope to, they will remain, um, you know, and, and establish a long-term presence. 
Uh, there's a lot of efforts in the world that are trying to uh, uh, tackle this from a holistic perspective, but one of the things that uh, the elements that we have that makes us particularly interesting and stands out as a global effort is folks like uh, Matt and uh, Jenny. Uh, of course, many of you know that uh, this university is home to the Weight Research Institute, one of the foremost ag tech uh, research institutions on the planet. And the fact that leaders from that, uh, that institute have thrown their uh, amazing talents into this problem sets us apart from just about every other uh, effort on the planet. So um, if you're a University of Adelaide grad or aficionado, uh, you, can, you can take a lot of pride in that. And we certainly do um, with having Jenny and, and, and Matt working on this problem with us. So as uh, two of the most foremost space ag plant scientists in the world that I know, um, <laughs> I'd just like to, to, to ask, you mentioned 20 years out for Mars. So that's actually right around the corner, really, when we think about space operations. So can you kind of describe for us where are we starting from? What's the current level of, or current state of the art of the research? So yeah, the state of the art, as I was describing before, so the state of the art in terms of rocket propulsion systems, of getting the rovers uh, to Mars, and even people, we're, we're pretty much there. It's, it's not too far away. In terms of keeping people alive is the real problem. So up here, good, yes. This is the current state of the art for growing plants in space. This is the veggie system. It's about a meter cubed, so that we're just, um, they're just harvesting the crop. So this is the complete crop that they can grow in that. There's two systems, the advanced plant habitat and the, the veggie system, and they're both about a meter cubed in volume. So they can have a tray of plants. And so that's great for, well, I'll go to this slide. So that's great for a, maybe your parsley on the plate kind of uh, aspect, a bit of garnish, but also, keeping that, that mental, you know, psychological boost that Jenny was talking about. So this is an example of um, chilies, the most recent crop that was grown on the ISS. And they had lots of fun. They added it to everything for a bit of variety and flavor. Here's a floating zero G space taco. So they spiced up everything. And um, in fact, in the, the recent launch, um, Megan was, was talking about uh, what the, the most exciting thing she was doing and the thing that kept her going, and it was the chilies on the space station. So uh, it's a really big thing. Part of the reason for that is that this is the monotonous diet. You know, the prepackaged, the, the uh, dehydrated diet, the microwave TV dinner kind of diet that you get, and it gets a bit monotonous after a while. So adding a bit of variety with plants is what NASA are looking at. So they have this pick and eat program at the moment with varieties of crop. And we can go beyond that to think about how we can make plants the number one source of nutrition in an ongoing fashion on Mars. So how can, it be, how can we scale up from a meter cubed at the moment to advanced production systems? to, oh, and that's maybe best um, elaborated upon by Scott Kelly. I think this was in 2015, Jenny, after the first uh, experiment, the first harvest of lettuce on the space station. We lived on the space station here for a while. I understand the, uh, the uh, logistical complexity of having uh, people live and work in space for long periods and the, uh, the supply chain that is required to keep us going. And if we're, ever going to go to Mars someday, we will, and, uh, but whatever that is, we're going to have to have a spacecraft that is much more uh, self-sustainable uh, with regards to its uh, food supply. So look at the sheer joy there, some fresh food on the space station. So I was talking earlier about those 10 deliveries to the space station every year. The astronauts, when they get asked what they want to be delivered, you know, to, to uh, keep them, um, to give them some joy, they often say fresh fruit, fruit or some kind of fresh vegetable. Um, and that's the reason for them being so happy about growing their own food and supplying it there. 
So this is a mock-up of uh, that they have at Kennedy Space Station of fi a fitted out X module of um, uh, a spacecraft showing how they might scale up production. And here is part of our vision of how we might be able to do that on Mars. So you'll see racks of plants in the background, more akin to controlled environment agriculture that I think we'll touch upon in a bit later. So the kind of high production systems for high value crops that we have here on Earth. Maybe just a, a bit of history of that sustainable piece. So I, I talked earlier about the, the closed systems of space and how they are in a way a model for sustainability. So they're completely closed. You have to take everything with you. We can simulate that kind of thing on Earth, or we can at least try. And maybe the solutions that we have to have to deliver those sustainability um, pieces will help us here on Earth. So this was the first experiment in the 90s at the University of Arizona, Biosphere. And they ran two experiments. They had large ecological, you know, it was a large ecological large logical experiment where they had lots of different species. They both only lasted a few months. A lot of species died. They didn't produce enough oxygen. This is a system more akin to what might be happening in space. So instead of those large geodomes, it might be that kind of controlled environment agriculture racking. This is the Lunar Palace. They ran a couple of experiments just a few years ago, and they managed to keep in this cl completely closed system a, a crew of, I think it was uh, four or five people in these modules, completely isolated for 200 days in one session and then a, a 100 days prior to that. So a whole year they had these people surviving on these plant modules, producing all the oxygen, recycling the waste. So this is an analogue of what may be possible in years to come. And this is NASA's current experiment where they're they're working more on the, the psychological piece and also the nutrition piece. So this isn't a completely closed system, but they, they will be isolating the, the crew in what they're uh, dubbing Mars Dune Alpha. And one of the really cool things about this is that they're also simulating building the habitats and they're 3D printing the, the construction materials from simulated Mars regolith. And this is the mock-up and this is actually under construction. They're just recruiting into that now, and they're gonna be running experiments over a year where they feed the astronauts very diets. They look at that psychological piece. It's a, you know, a real, it's a, a proper scientific big brother experiment, but without the TV cameras that are live broadcast. So it, you know, it's gonna tell us a lot of how people cope in isolation. So um, yeah, I think I'd like to end that question there. Jenny, have you got anything else you'd no, like to add? No, no, that's all good. Okay. Um, well, actually, I will, before you, uh, to continue the kind of the psychology idea, the reason we have this picture up here, I might as well explain now, is so this is a bouquet of zinnias that was grown on the space station by one of the astronauts. He chose to take those seeds up there, and then they got really sick. He, he germinated the seedlings because um, of how water moves in space. It's kind of sticky. So it tends to stick onto plants and you end up getting some diseases happening that you wouldn't necessarily happen on Earth. But he ended up taking the care of these, these flowers so seriously that he nursed them back to health and he took great pride in sort of getting them alive. And then he took, when they finally flowered, he took some photos out in the couple. He had a whole uh, photo shoot going with them about how, how pleased he was. And he said it really, again, that kind of mental health aspect of keeping the plants alive. So. That's that beautiful picture that we have there. So in, in response to what you were just saying, I, I, I think I have a question for Jenny, but um, I would just say that, you know, um, as a non-plant scientist, on the, on the rare occasion that I'm not eating pizza, I sometimes eat fresh food. So that I can sort of understand the importance of that. Um, but what we're talking about here seems like it might deliver more than just simple nutrition, right? So, is it, so what, what else would this particular research um, deliver for us? Can it promote sustainability? Can it deliver other products to the astronauts of, that are useful? Yeah, thank you, John. Yes, so 
this kind of comes back to this idea of, of a question we get fairly regularly is, why are you doing research in space when there's all these issues on Earth that we have to face? So uh, climate change, uh, growing populations that we need to feed. And I think one of the points I'd really like to, to make here is that space research has really driven innovation in a way that affects all of our lives today. And you get this cycle that kind of feeds between the two. And that's partly because when you think about solving challenges in space, it's in a way where everything is restricted. So it really focuses in the mind on, you have a very, very limited amount of resources. You have a limited amount of, of space, of, vo of volume to use. You, have, you can't just resupply. So given those constraints, how do you make a sustainable, effective system? And because of that, that can really sort of, it really enables people to think in new and imaginative ways, I think. And um, this slide, it's very busy, I'm sorry, but I just wanted to kind of get, give you the idea of some of the innovations that you are probably making use of right now um, that have come out of, this is just NASA research. They have a fantastic uh, publication called Tech Briefs where they describe some of the innovations that have come out of their research that are now used on Earth. Uh, and this is just some examples. So there's a lot in the, in the health space, so cochlear implants. Um, the resistant, the scratch resistant coating on your glasses, on your, on your um, eyeglasses, uh, insulin pumps if you're diabetic, all of these came out of NASA research. But there's also things in, in terms of engineering. So they, the, there's a, a compound called trike that's used for groundwater cleanup. That came out of the fact that jet fuel was contaminating uh, the water sources, but then they found a way of cleaning it up, and that's now used quite widely in industry. And there's an anti-corrosion coating, which was most recently used for painting the Statue of Liberty. So one other thing is uh, solar, solar panels, solar technology. It wasn't invented at NASA, but they really pushed its development at a time when it wasn't really clear there was a commercial use for it. And they developed it to a point that now it's, it's widely used. And the second that's relevant to some of the science we're talking about today is LEDs. So they um, partnered with a company to develop solid state LEDs. And then a NASA scientist had this idea of whether or not they could be used for growing plants. Previously, there had been this idea that plants would need the full spectrum sunlight to grow effectively. And instead, they showed that you could use a narrow ba band wavelength LEDs and get um, healthy plant growth. And so that kind of brings me to this idea of how we can use space research to really inform this idea of closed environment agriculture. So vertical farming is often a term you'll, you'll hear to describe it as, as well. I would say that even, I don't know, seven years ago, if, if you'd asked a lot of people, including me, I'd have said it was a pretty niche thing that was happening, this idea of growing plants indoors for feeding people. And that perhaps it made sense in places like Singapore, where you're very, very space constrained. But I didn't really see it taking off anywhere like Australia, for example, where we are not short of space. But the technology has developed to such a point that the, the LED lighting is now fantastic. There's been huge strides made that plants grow really, really well under this LED lighting. Um, solar panels have made solar electricity very, very cheap. And that means we can think about growing plants indoors. And then this actually has benefits for things like water usage, because we can recycle all of the water. So you have a much lower water footprint than, say, conventional agriculture. And you can also do it in the location where those plants are needed. So this means that you can reduce your, your carbon footprint from things like uh, food transportation. Um, and so we can also think about the benefits to, say, remote communities, uh, so people who would otherwise struggle to get fresh fruit and vegetables. So there's lots of aspects of this. And if we think about what type of plants you might want to grow in these containerized environments, they have a lot of the properties that we talked about of, of those plants we might have in space. So you want them to be kind of short stature so you can stick them onto shelves, fast growing, um, highly nutritious. So all of those things that we're learning when we're thinking about designing those crops for space, a lot of that work, apart from possibly the gravity stuff, will all fit very nicely into a closed environment ag as well, including my duckweed, I hope. Um, and this is not a small market. So Agriculture in Australia, it's looking by 2030, the goal is to have it at a 200 billion um, productivity level. That's enormous. And if you think about the plant protein, the functionalized protein, the functionalized food market, that's uh, aiming for more than 700 
um, billion dollars as well. So these are huge, huge markets. And the closed environment ag market itself is showing a 23% uh, annual growth. So it's really, really rapidly growing. And you'll start to see more and more of these companies around, including in South Australia. And finally, I just want to bring up the bioeconomy because it actually gets back to John's question before I rambled on. <laughs> Sorry, John. Um, is that we can think about what, what these systems can do for us beyond production of food. If we really want to wean ourselves off petrochemicals, if we want to make sure our plastics come from a biological, biological system, if we want our fuels to come from a biological system, then we have to think about um, where that carbon comes from and supporting that industry. So people talk about the bioeconomy, and that really just means that the carbon is renewable carbon. We're using biotechnology to, to produce things. And so this is estimated to be a 30 trillion US dollar global market by 2030. And it is growing enormously, and there's government support for this around the world, because it really allows you to do things like bring manufacturing back on site um, in country. It also reduces reliance on, say, imports of things like oil and gas. And what I wanted to do today was to give you three examples of companies that are already existing and thriving that are using um, bi so biotechnology to produce these biologically derived molecules. So just give you a flavor of where things are going now. So one example is a company called Bolt Threads. Um, they were just across the road from my, the lab that I worked in in the US. And they were started as a group of PhD students who were working on spider silk produced by golden orb weaver spiders. And they wanted to find a way of producing this in, in yeast they, they chose. Because it turns out you can't farm the spiders very densely because they eat each other. But the silk they produce is in, has incredible properties of strength. Um, so you can produce things like uh, replacements for things like Kevlar, but you can also produce fabrics that are very hard wearing. And it's all from biological systems. So they found a way of producing the spider silk protein in yeast. The much harder thing was how do you weave that into the threads? It turns out that the way the spiders have evolved is incredible. But they found a way of doing that, and they produced these beautiful uh, silk protein threads, which can now be woven into clothes. I will say it's still pretty expensive. But that's there's kind of the science and research piece, and then it becomes the development piece. But they're certainly making progress. A second com company I just wanted to mention is um, called Impossible Foods. You can actually buy their products in Wool Woolies right now. So they've made a meat replacement. And their goal was they saw the, the, the greenhouse gas footprint from cattle as being a major problem they wanted to solve. But they also recognized that a lot of people still want their meat to taste like meat. They want a burger to cook up like a burger. And so they went after the scientific question, how do we do that from plant proteins? Um, so that red color you get in meat comes from heme proteins that carry iron. And that's what browns up when you're cooking, along with some of the sugars. And so they found a plant protein that also has very, it's a related protein that has very similar properties. And you get it in the nodules of soy plants, and that's what you see up on the left-hand side. And that's also a pinkish color, so it has the same kind of effect. They've introduced it into their meat substitute burgers, and they've now shown you, this is what it looks like when you cook it up. You can cook it rare, medium, um, and it tastes pretty good. It's not healthy. It's not healthier, I would say, than, than beef, because it still has a high fat content. It has all the things, but it has that flavor. So it's getting people to think about different, trying different types of food and, and changing what they've got. And finally, because, because of plants, um, this is an example of a plant-based company. So it's a Canadian company called Medicargo. And they were able to produce a COVID vaccine, uh, one of the protein-based vaccines, in a plant called Nicoshana benthamiana. It's a Australian tobacco plant actually that's used widely for production of these types of molecules and they just uh, have been given the go-ahead to to pr produce uh, 72 million doses I think for the Canadian government because they've shown pretty good efficacy in trials and again because you're producing it in plants you can really scale that up in response to a rapid need such as for example a pandemic so with that that's just some examples of what's out there um, I'll hand you back to John I think we might be ready for some questions from the audience. Hmm. I think no problem. All right, well, thank you all very much for sharing your uh, insights into those sort of pre-prepared questions. Um, we can now kick off our audience Q&A section of the night. So I do have some pre-submitted questions, but uh, we will have some roving mics around as well, but uh, we'll start off with some of our pre-submitted ones. So uh, our first one is from David, and David asks, 
Other than vitamin B12, what's preventing future space travelers from eating a purely plant-based diet? Uh, and is the B12 issue a solvable problem other than via supplements? So go ahead. Um, yeah. yeah, I think you should answer that, considering okay. you might invoke duckweed <laughs> at some point. <laughs> It's not all about duckweed, but um, yeah, so vitamin B12 is really the key vitamin that's missing from um, a plant-based diet. Vitamin D is the other one that it's much harder to get, although you can get it from some uh, fungi and, and sort of bacterial introduction. Um, but I'll start with vitamin B12. So uh, you, it's a very complex molecule, but we are actually looking at, and um, other groups around the world are looking at ways whether we can engineer that into the plant as well, so you'd make a complete nutri nutrition. Or whether you can do, for example, uh, co-cultivation with a microbe or grow mushrooms, for example, with it. The other nutrients that are a bit limiting, I mentioned vitamin D. We actually have a PhD student here at University of Adelaide who's just started, and one of his uh, research goals is to engineer the vitamin D production pathway into duckweed. So um, we're, we're curious to see how well that goes and if we can make it in the right quantities and in a bioavailable form that will suit a human diet. Um, beyond that, it's just making sure that there's some variety in the diet. So you don't want to eat the same thing day in, day out, because then you just come back to that same problem of the looking at a boring plate of food. Um, yeah, so I, I think a, a major part of it, obviously we, we've covered some of the food angles here and the production of these items within the food base, but it's also about making interesting things out of that food, and that comes to the processing. Can you take, for instance, a, a complete caloric, a, a nutritional replacement such as duckweed and form it into multiple different forms of food? Uh, there are some space-specific nutrients as well that um, they have found from work on the ISS, for instance, things, another B vitamin like folate, um, that becomes low or is actually is needed in, in higher amounts to protect against some of the, the issues, the hazards in space around um, the uh, difference in gravity and radiation and the like. That, so you can increase the amount of nutrients of a certain uh, requirement as well is needed in space. So I think in answer to the question, was it David that answered? Yeah, good. Um, I think it is possible, but it's going to require um, some work to get those nutrients in place. Uh, but we are along that pathway, so it, it's possible. Fantastic. So those comments sort of tie in nicely with a second pre-submitted question, which is from Rachel, who asks, will plants besides leafy greens be possible to grow? So you've mentioned duckweed and genetically engineering it so it can be uh, have different nutrients, etc. Uh, but she asks, will fruit be possible? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, so maybe not sort of fruit trees to start with, but uh, things like strawberries, uh, carrots, radishes. There are lots of there's lots of things we can think about growing. And people, that, even on the space station already, in those very small units, they've already successfully grown more than 20 species of plants, including a dwarf wheat. Actually, so we can think about the cereals are a bit harder to to think about for growing for food, just because they take a long time to grow and you only eat the seed part of the head. As I said, we want to try and think about plants where we eat as much of the plant as possible. But certainly we should be able to grow um, a wide variety of, of plants so you get that sort of balance and interest in your diet. Mm. Yeah, I, I guess one thing to think about is the, the waste aspect. So in space, you can foresee that, again, because you have to take everything with you to, to have something that is grown and using energy that you either gather from from sunlight or you know with the, the solar panels and the like you don't want waste so can you recycle whatever you're growing so for instance if you did have a tomato plant can you make use of the other bits that you are not harvesting not you know not the fruit can you make materials out of um, you know building materials or, or something out of the the other parts so you have to think wisely about what you're growing but it, it would be possible and I'll just add to that one thing we to also think of is that there's two ways of thinking about what we're growing. There's what do you grow on the way to Mars? So what can you grow in a, in a space shuttle, which is very confined space? 
And that might be more on the sort of leafy green, strawberry side of things, versus what do you grow when you have a longer term habitation, when you've got the space to, um, to grow more things and grow more variety and perhaps larger amounts of infrastructure for dealing with it. Because the other thing to think about is that astronauts are kind of busy people. They've got a lot on just keeping things running. If, if you listen to them describe their days, that because NASA kind of organizes their days for them, it's very, very long days, lots and lots of tasks, because things always need fixing and repairing. So they can't spend a large amount of time sort of farming, if you like. So to what extent can we also in introduce automation to the system, um, robotics, and so that it, it kind of takes care of itself? And that applies to then on Earth applications too, because equally, most people don't have lots of time, free time available necessary for producing their food. So how do you ensure that food production happens without putting a large labor burden on, on people at the same time? Interesting questions. So I might ask one more of our pre-submitted questions and then I'll open up to our in-person and online audiences for their questions. I've got a couple of extra ones, but I'll keep them up my sleeve if people need a bit more time to think. Uh, so this uh, third pre-submitted question is from Ross and he says, as a high school teacher of awe and wonder, what can I do with students to engage them in this endeavor? Do you want to go, John? One. <laughs> yes, thanks. Thanks for that. So, um, well, uh, so of course, the the answer would be it's maybe it's simple and maybe it's hard. So what we've found is that uh, whenever you talk about space, anything, fill in the blank, that seems to um, interest lots of students immediately. You if if we held a space dance here at the university, we would get more people in attendance than if it was just a regular dance. So that tends to be a topic that really seems to um, click with younger generations. So I think, um, you know, I think it's fantastic that you describe your job in such a way because obviously the, your enthusiasm would, would uh, be important uh, in transmitting that information to the students. Um, what is really interesting about this point in history is that maybe in the last 50 years, well, I, I like to say that ne the next 50 years for space are gonna be very, very different than the last 50 years. And I see just a couple people in the room that might have a little bit of gray in their hair like myself, who might remember or, or have been around during the Apollo landings, and you may have thought that, you know, I thought by the time I graduated, high school, I'd be you know, getting, buying a ticket to the moon, and I'd go up there for, to university or something. And of course, that didn't really happen, but things, the pace of space development is changing exponentially now. So whereas in the old days, you may have been forced into a STEM pathway to participate in this amazing adventure that's about to occur, uh, that's, that's not so. Part of uh, the members of our team are from every school in the university. Psychology is incredibly important, and you've, you, uh, we might hear a little bit more about that uh, uh, later, but we have psychologists and architects and business people and lawyers, they're all critical to this effort. So uh, to your students, you could say any kind of engineering, any kind of science is space engineering and space science, but then so are the professions in the social sciences. So there's really room for everybody in the next 50 years of space. We have an artist in residence at, at our center, and uh, that's an important aspect of our outreach, and then also for the activities of, of folks in space, mm. so. Thanks, and was it Ross, the question? Yeah, so um, he should also get in touch with us. We got links through to um, a, a network of teachers and resources in, in space and some activities around that, so we can definitely get them in touch with them. Um, activities. Yeah, I'm sure that would yeah. be very helpful. And we've even been over to schools to talk to students as well, so Matt and I have both, I'm sure John has too, has actually gone into classrooms. I bring duckweed with me though, so you, you, have to, you have to be warned. But yeah, so it's a great opportunity to speak to people. Yeah, absolutely, fantastic. All right, are there any questions uh, in the audience? Uh, just pop your hand up and Nick or Liz will come around to you with a microphone if you're chosen. We do have one in the middle there. Oh, you have to hold it. Great. Okay. Um, I hope this isn't too broad. Uh, do you have any thoughts on what our relationship to the land will be? Um, 
say for an example, uh, biblically, there was an agrarian perspective. And so that uh, culture came up around taking care of the land. And I just think with all these areas that you're trying to holistically come with that um, looking at this question um, of our relationship to the land uh, and our values, I think, could be really important. So, what do you think? Very yeah. interesting. Someone jump in. That's a great question. Um, I, I'll, I'll go first. And, and John was mentioning uh, that in our team, we have uh, psychologists, we have um, people in law, people in policy, uh, philosophy as well, and ethics. And I think that the questions you raise are very important, both from the philosophical, but also the, the legal perspectives as well about our rights to, uh, I'm going to use completely the wrong term, and it's not exploit. <laughs> but um, so how can we use the resources effectively in, in a way that is um, both legally acceptable, because a lot of laws in space are, are not sorted out yet. We don't know, you know, what kinds of crops we can grow. We don't know necessarily how we can use the resources there being built as we speak before we do it. So there is the legal, there's the philosoph philosophical, and they are things that we're going to have to work out. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I was just going to add that there's some people who are starting to think about some of these questions about what would, say, habitat design look like so that people still felt a sense of home home and connection as well. So there was uh, Jess and George, who's a synthetic biologist at University of Sydney. She came to talk to us hmm. um, recently, and she's worked with some artists to start to think about how would you design a habitat which... And actually, they had a lot of plants at the centre of it, which is why we were talking to her. Um, and you know, at well, what point would you want to look out onto the surface, or would you want it to? to would you be? And if you're below the surface, how would you still get that feeling of connection um, to what's a fairly hostile environment? And, and as people start to develop a culture there, does it become a separate culture from those who are back on Earth? And how do you navigate those spaces? And I think we are right at the beginning to start to think about some of those things. But I think that's a that's a really interesting interface between science and why it's such an interesting space area to work in because we get to have those conversations we perhaps don't normally have in our day-to-day -day work usually. And I'll just uh, add one more, one more point there. Um, so while within our center, um, we have a number of global firsts and you know, the best in the world in a number of different areas, the things that really um, help us to stand out, uh, our organization is sort of broken into modules. And one of our modules is the sustainability module, and Matt and Jenny lead that module. So while we stand out and we're best in class in a whole lot of areas, you might be gratified to know that the fact that we have a sustainability module is actually pretty common. So the, uh, the other efforts around the globe that are looking at these kinds of problems, everybody is talking about sustainability, responsible use um, of any resources, um, that we would need along the way to feed and, and water our astronauts and plants. So it's, there's a global conversation about this, um, and it's, uh, it's really, really robust and, and is one of the first things we discuss um, in our meetings. Such a good question. Thank you. We'll go to the gentleman up the back. Thank you. Um, on Earth, we have a problem with um, fertilizer and nutrients. We have to keep supplementing to grow our crops. You're talking about a closed loop system. What's going to be your strategy for providing those sort of um, fertilizers and nutrients to keep these plants growing? Okay, um, so the first thing that, that Jenny mentioned before in terms of controlled environment agriculture, the, the stats are that in terms of nutrient input and water input, it's about in the 90s, so 90%. Not up to 98% more efficient. So first things first is you get a lot less uh, waste, a lot less loss of those nutrients. Secondly, it's about recycling. So what the astronauts, um, what the crew 
consume but do not absorb, then we'll have to reuse that. And there are, we're, a great thing about this, so John is, uh, has mentioned, you know, we've, we've got some world leading expertise in certain areas. Another great thing about space research is that it's so collaborative and because the effort is, it's phenomenally hard what we're, we're doing here. You know, as I said, JPL were here yesterday. They're doing amazing things. They're sending, you know, <laughs> we were hearing about the Voyager mission and it's 45 years and, and running there, you know, outside the solar system, doing crazy things, but keeping people alive, that's a whole new level. Um, where I was going with this? So we're collaborating with people around the world that are recycling nutrients, so feeding human waste to plants. But you are right, we will have to take a base level of things with us to initially, if we're on the, the, the vehicles, to, to feed the plants. And once we are there, we're going to have to um, obtain those resources from the sources that we, um, we visit. Anything further? So, any other comments? No. no. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have time for another couple of questions and we'll go to the lady in the back again. Um, my question really stems back to water supply, but I'll put a little twist on that. Essentially, our bodies need to cycle through so much water in a period and it's necessary for the food that we eat to ha maintain that water content. But also it's about getting rid of the toxins that we're exposed to in an environment, the dusts, materials and just the general background radiations all of those things will accumulate so what sort of things have you looked at in terms of that relationship between the water and the cumulative impacts just to clarify are you talking about the the um say the accumulation of toxins and the like? Or, or are you talking about simply about the, the recycling of, of water? Sorry, could you just clarify? Really, I'm talking about in our own bodies, the cumulative effects of the ah. toxicity. Yeah. Right, OK. So yeah, the, the effects of space on the human body and how that will influence the physiology. Um, I think that goes back to the, the hazards. Um, yeah. So do you want to elaborate a bit further? Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I can do a little bit. So on this, we, we have a fair amount of, this is not an active area of research, you might be able to tell Matt and I, but people have been looking at this for a while because on the space station, water is in very short supply. When we go to Mars or the moon, there's, um, there's ice that we can make use of to, we can, that can be melted and used for producing, for producing water. But at the moment on the ISS, they have to recycle everything. So even, uh, the water they drink is actually recycled from the condensate from breathing out and the sweat of their colleagues on the space station. So NASA has very, very effective water filters that not only filter the water, but actually they have this, one of the outputs is these systems that check it's actually safe to drink because it, you can't have people getting sick, but it, the, this water is, is you know, it's going through a lot and they ha don't have a lot of space for doing that recycling. So they capture every drop and then they, they clean it up and it's checked for safety for going hmm. back through. Um. Yeah. And I think that the question extended on to, for instance, um, we can talk about scenario on Mars. Um, we're you know, nine months away from, from Earth. If the, the effects of space were to accumulate and um, to a point that induced either a, an illness or people obviously unexpectedly could come down with a, you know, a, a disease or, or the like. And so that is why we've talked about the on-demand in situ production of things to treat ailments that might um, actually come in, in effect due to the just general life or the, the effects of space. So, for instance, we have colleagues at UC Davis that are producing drugs that affect uh, and increase bone density in, in lettuce, and they, um, that will become 
not only useful in space, partly due to the lower gravity, both on the moon, in zero G and on Mars, where the, the gravity is different, but also potentially could be used as an alternative source for the production of those kinds of um, needed medication, you know, in, for osteoporosis treatment and the like. So it is important that we develop these technologies for unexpected things to occur and to deal with those. Um, but as, as Jenny said, there through the hazards system, we already have identified, there's a list, there's a massive document, in fact, it's um, quite a read, um, but it, it contains a lot of the, the issues that arise from being in space, and they will only accumulate the further we go away and outside of the protection of the, the atmosphere that we have. Yeah. So it's, it's really going to be a lot of unknowns, to be honest, and that's why the people doing this, I think, are pretty brave to be going for many, many reasons. Um, I think we're going to be learning as we go, and that's why NASA's developed so many of the sort of wearable sensors to try and monitor people's health, and that's going to be one of the questions. And then this on-demand production just deals with those unforeseens that arise as, as much as possible. Can we then uh, sort of work out what's happening and then help to treat them? But it's, it's going to be an experiment, essentially. Thank you. That was a, oh, would you like to make a comment, John? Well, I would just say, with regard to water, uh, we're really kind of fortunate, and the first destination we're headed to is probably one of the most challenging. So we'll go to the moon. It's a really, really hard place uh, to put humans for a, for a long period of time, but it's close. We can resupply. We can come home if there's a problem. Once we get past the moon, once we get to Mars, water availability doesn't, that, that, that that problem begins to go away. Mars is uh, incredibly wet. There's uh, water all over the place there. Um, same with the number of the asteroids, and then you start getting out into the outer planets, and you know, we, you know um, Europa and Enceladus, you know, they have three times the water of the Earth on each one of those moons. So there's lots and lots of water in, in the solar system once you get past the moon. So we'll, we'll actually learn in a really hard environment, and then things should get easier from that perspective. Thank you, that was a really interesting question. So we have unfortunately come right up to the end of our uh, allotted time this evening, but I would like to give our speakers uh, one last opportunity for any closing remarks. Anything else you'd like to add? Um, no, apart from if, um, if you wanna know more, we're, we're certainly available to, um, you know, to, to continue the conversation and especially with uh, the next generation. So. Ross and, and the school kids and you know, others, I think that is the important piece of the puzzle here, that we will now have a, a generation of, of um, students that we can have you know, the, the lens of space inspiring a new generation to, to do all kinds of things. And, and not only here on, not only here for space, but also here on Earth. And I think getting more people into STEM education to, um, to, to inspire the next generation is something that we um, really need on this planet for, for multiple reasons, and we certainly need it for uh, the challenge of space habitation. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'll just add that I think we're very lucky being where we are in South Australia, just because we've got lot 14 down the road, and that ability for us who are not, we didn't train in the space area. We, we know we're plant biologists, agricultural scientists, to be able to wander down the road and ask questions, to see people from JPL come here and talk is really, really quite spectacular. And so that's really allowed us to push forward and do what we do. Um, I think we wouldn't be able to do that very many other places. Um, and it helps me in terms of training students because we have lots of opportunities around here, not, not just academically, but with industry as well. And so that nexus of so South Australia's agriculture and and space and some nascent space industry, but growing space industry makes it a really exciting place to be. And I think we're just getting going. So I'm, I'm just kind of excited for what happens next. Me too. Well, I would like to finish now by thanking uh, our speakers tonight, Matt, Jenny, and our wonderful facilitator, John. Uh, please join me in thanking our speakers. And thank you to you, our audience, as always, for viewing and for your fantastic questions and comments. We look forward to inviting you back in June when we're going to hear from another panel of amazing speakers on new and emerging foods of the future. 
So be sure to sign up for our mailing list to receive the latest information about that and all other Research uh, Tuesdays related news. Thank you once again for tuning in tonight and we hope to see you next time. Good night. <laughs>